Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Huron. Thank you for being here and staying here till the end. Um, I apologize for speaking in English, but that's, uh, that's the way I'm gonna go here. Um, so I, uh, I'm a geographer. I'm an associate professor at the University of the District of Columbia in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. Um, and I really want to thank Renato for inviting me. Muito obrigada. Um, this is really a wonderful uh, experience, so thanks a lot to everyone for being here. I was planning on talking about a different research project, not the one you see here. Um, the title of my talk is different than this. The reason for that is over the course of the week as we've been talking about things, I thought it would make more sense to talk about this research, um, which is related to my original plan. But um, So I recently uh, wrote a book about the urban commons, which just came out um, last or earlier this year. And I thought um, it would, might, might make sense to talk about some of the ideas in this book. So. In this book, I'm really theorizing the urban commons through a close investigation of limited equity housing cooperatives in Washington, D.C. Um, and I do have a few copies of this. If you want one afterwards, come please talk to me. Um, so the title of my talk is The Work of the Urban Commons, Fighting Gentrification in Washington, D.C. So first I'm gonna talk about how I understand the commons, um, and then I'll move into the case of looking at, at what's going on in, in my city of Washington. So, the urban commons, there's many ways to think about this idea, and I know there's a lot of good work being done. It's come up this week already. There's a lot of good work happening around the world here. Um, I have a pretty specific definition because it helps me to think more clearly about what I see happening. Um, so thinking about the commons, what's the commons? A resource really that's marked by two key traits. Um, it's been decommodified, at least mostly, um, and it's collectively governed, perhaps also collectively owned. And then importantly, it's also not just a resource, it's a social process, um, a social act. The commons are created and maintained by people working together over time. So um, commoning, which Peter Leinabau uh, uses that word to describe, it emphasizes that this is an ongoing task. Um, until, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, most of the work on the commons looked at natural resources, at traditional communities, rural areas, um, but there's been more and more work on the urban commons because the city is, is the site of such contestation and so much of humanity is increasingly living in cities, so we need to figure this out. Um, so thinking about the urban commons, um, I really uh, think it has kind of three distinct qualities. Um, one, the city is made up in large part by strangers. Um, so unlike traditional rural communities, um, you don't necessarily have personal relationships with everyone in a city. You can't. That's the nature of urban life. Um, so on the one hand, it may be harder to common um, with people in a city. On the other hand, this may um, bring up some interesting opportunities to try to work together with strangers, which, with people from different places to figure out how to work together. Um, secondly, cities oops, cities really uh, came into existence as a way to store wealth and capital. Um, and we often see higher land and real estate pressure in cities. So the urban commons exists in the context of these super saturated real estate markets. And it's a, a lot of intense pressure on these cities um, and more pressure on people without access to wealth and capital. So is it harder to maintain these kinds of spaces in the urban context? Um, it's a real, there might be real challenges to commoning in this city. Um, and then third, cities um, exist in the context of relatively uh, tight regulation, close regulation by the state. Um, some historians argue that permanent settlements, cities really came about in part because it enabled those in power to more effectively control people. Um, James C. Scott makes this argument. So trying to seize and maintain commons in the city forces us to deal with the question of the relationship um, between the commons and the state. And I think we often see the state as antagonistic to commoning efforts, um, but I think we can also look at how the state actually can support a commons, and a city can be a good place to, to look at that relationship. So I think these are the challenges of trying to common in the urban context. And I'm interested in taking these challenges seriously um, and encountering kind of what's sometimes a romantic idea of the commons. Um, and so there's real work involved in seizing the commons, keeping it, expanding it. So I'm talking here specifically about limited equity cooperatives and theorizing them as a form of the commons. So a limited equity housing cooperative is one in which you um, purchase a share in the co-op for a relatively low amount. In the DC case, um, the average amount that people would purchase a share for would be about $3,000 or so. So that's just the, the share in the apartment building, essentially. Um, and then you pay very low monthly fees to stay there. Um, and so these monthly fees, again, in the Washington case, are about half of the average rents of the market rate rents um, of the city. Um, 
And then if you ever importantly, what's really important about this is that if you ever sell your share, you're restricted in the amount of money you can make when you sell your share. You're restricted in the amount of equity you can gain. That's why they're limited equity co-ops. Um, and really, usually members, they, they, if they purchase a share for $3,000, they move out 10 years later, they're selling that share for $3,000 plus a small amount of interest. So that's really not a way to make money, significant money off of this investment in housing. So the, the idea here is to remove this housing from the speculative market um, and to make it affordable for the long term, for multiple generations of people who are moving in there. Um, so we have, um, you know, earlier this week heard about the seminar on property and transformation, which asked questions like, who's property for? Can we transform property into something that's for the working people who live in the city? Um, and several presentations today have dealt with this question. How do we transform property? And limited equity co-ops are one way to do that. Um, so, on to my case of Washington, D.C. This is one of many of the co-ops that we have. This is a grand opening celebration in the early 1990s at the Florian Gardens Cooperative. Um, this city, D.C., has a large number of limited equity co-ops. Um, usually when we hear about tenant organizing in the United States, we think about New York, San Francisco, um, and so I think it's important to think about other kinds of cities and in the spirit that we're here at this conference, thinking uh, more globally and not just about the certain cities that we always kind of research and hear about. Um, so one of my questions in my research was how did this come about? How was it that in this one city, it's a small city, about 700,000 people, it is the capital of the United States, so it's obviously got that kind of uh, import to it. Um, but how did the commons emerge here? And I think it's important to look historically at how commons have emerged over time so we can get a sense of how we might seize them in the present. So my theory is really that in this city, and this is, I'm getting into a little bit of the history here um, in this particular case, is that we have all these housing co-ops because the political will was generated in the 1970s to do something about gentrification and displacement in the city. There's a massive uh, wave of gentrification in Washington, D.C. in the 1970s. Um, but there, were, um, there was also, we just had gained new political power in the city in the 70s, so I'll take a minute to explain that. So how a commons emerged in D.C. in the 70s, we had newly gained black political power. Um, Washington, D.C. is a city that did not have any local democracy for 100 years, from 1874 until 1974. Um, and that was largely a uh, racialized phenomena. We were the first city in the United States to become a majority African-American, majority black city. Um, we had a lot of black people moving to DC from the South right after the Civil War to escape slavery and the horrors of racial violence in the South. Um, and so we had a growing black presence, political presence in the city, and we therefore lost the right to vote in 1874 because the other p white leaders in the city were af afraid of black political power. So in 1974, we gained that right to vote back in the city. Um, and we immediately elected um, a mostly black city council that was also very progressive, came out of the civil rights organizing, came out of the student nonviolent coordinating committee, which was the kind of left wing of the civil rights movement. Um, and they were very progressive and were thinking about civil rights, but also economic rights. And so really thinking about how do we transform economic relations in this city now that we are in power. So this is one element, but as I said, at the same time, we had this wave of gentrification hitting the city um, in the 70s. And this was true in a number of US cities in the 70s, this kind of wave of gentrification. So a newspaper article from 1979, um, you see low-income blacks pushed into PG. PG is Prince George's County. It's on the periphery, a suburb on the periphery. Um, high housing costs push low-income blacks into PG. Washington turning into a city for only the rich. And this is from 1979, and this is the same kind of language we hear, the same phenomena that's going on right now in the city. Um, so because we have this massive wave of gentrification, there's this fear that just as people have gained political power in the city, they're gonna be pushed out. Um, and so there was a lot of important tenant organizing in response, powerful tenant organizing, putting pressure on this newly elected city government. Um, WISH was one of the groups that was organizing against displacement. Again, this is a 1979 article. Um, we had uh, the Southern Columbia Tenants Heights uh, Tenants Union, had various kinds of tenant organizing going on in the city. Um, and so as a result of this tenant organizing, there was some very progressive anti-displacement legislation that was passed in the city in the 1970s. We had a rent control, um, an anti-speculation tax, a moratoria on converting rental buildings into condominiums. Um, and one of the acts that was really important was a, a law that gives tenants the right to buy the building if the landlord puts it up for sale. So this is still the law today in the city. Um, anytime a landlord wants to sell a building, they first have to give the right to buy to the tenants. 
Um, and this has resulted in many hundreds of tenant associations using that right to buy their buildings and keep them and become collective owners. And so, but low income tenant associations, when they buy those buildings, they need assistance, financial assistance from the city, and the city provides grants and loans to help them purchase their buildings. Um, and when they convert to cooperative, they create a limited equity cooperative so that housing can be affordable over the long term. Um, so these co-ops are all over the city, um, and tenants still use this right today to purchase their buildings and turn them into these limited equity housing co-ops. So just a few examples of some of this early organizing. This was a co-op they had received, it had been a rental building, they had received eviction notices on Christmas Eve, 1977. Um, they fought the eviction and they were eventually able to stay in the building. They held a block party, they organized in their neighborhood to get support, and they were actually able to purchase the building um, in 79, and it's still a limited equity co-op today, housing 63 families. Um, another one, um, this is like way on the other side of town, another early one, this was Barbara Valentine, was a tenant leader there. Um, they also were able to purchase their building, turn it into a co-op that is still around. Um, Daisy Fernandez was an immigrant from El Salvador, um, and she was a major tenant leader in her building and, and enabled them to purchase their, their building and turn it into a co-op. So I think this is important history to know sort of how tenants, low-income tenants, have been able to, to do this, to take their buildings. Um, a commons doesn't just emerge, doesn't just happen. We have to seize it. Um, and many of the people doing this work, as Sylvia Federici notes, are women. Um, and in the DC case, mostly women of color, black and Latina immigrant women. Um, so why is this commons important? What does it provide to its members? Um, I uh, conducted 40 in-depth interviews with co-op members from 10 co-ops around the city. Um, and my analysis is really based on these interviews that I did with people and their analysis and what they told me about why this was important to them. Um, and so there are really four key elements to uh, these co-ops, to this sort of urban commons that they're forming. Affordability, control, stability, and community. So I'll go through each one of these in turn and kind of talk about um, why these have been so important. So as I mentioned before, limited equity co-ops are about half the monthly cost of comparable rental housing in terms of your monthly payments. So this is um, a view of a neighborhood in the city in the 1980s that was gentrifying. And on the left, you see um, a condominium building that's getting renovated and there's um, preparing to be sold. And in the back, on the right, you see a rental apartment building. One of the windows is boarded up. So this apartment building is where some low-income tenants were living who were trying to buy their building and stay in this neighborhood, this very expensive neighborhood. So a Washington Post, the newspaper article said, the community, this is in 1986, is on the cutting edge of a gentrification process that's displacing some of its low-income housing stock with upscale condominiums. Um, the tenants back here um, in this building, um, tenants are, are, are facing eviction. They've only been paying $90 to $200 a month for their one-bedroom apartments. The neighborhood's gentrification is, quote, hindering us because the landlord feels like he can make a killing at our expense, said Rashida Ahmad, president building's tenant group called The Last Holdouts. And The Last Holdouts Tenant Association, they held out, they were able to buy their buildings, um, and here's a grand opening ceremony um, of, of celebrating that victory that they had to stay in this neighborhood, keep their affordable housing in a, in a gentrifying neighborhood. Um, so affordability was number one in terms of what was important to folks. The second thing was control. Um, many of these buildings were in terrible, terrible conditions by the time the tenants were actually able to buy them. Um, and so these are some examples of some of the conditions that some of the buildings were in by the time the landlords finally uh, gave them up. Um, and then this was just another co-op that's having a grand opening celebration. It says, we own it. Um, they had dealt with really terrible housing conditions for years. So um, control over the building, being able to fix it up the way they wanted to. So that physical control, but also social control was really important to people. They wanted to be able to determine who was allowed to move in. Um, they wanted to be able to write house rules to determine how people needed to behave if they were to live together in this space. Um, and so having that kind of social control was also really important. Um, stability was also was the third important thing. Um, a lot of research shows that it's better for children to grow up in more stable housing environments. So particularly for people raising children, they told me that that stability was really important. Um, and the stability really kind of combats the precarity that gentrification creates for limited, for low-income people. Um, and then finally, community was really important for folks too. Uh, oftentimes, the tenants who were living in these buildings, they didn't necessarily know each other that well. 
um, before they went through this process of buying a building and turning them into a co-op. Um, but through the process of working together, they really got to know one another. And this building was an interesting one. The tenants in the building, some spoke English, some spoke Spanish, some, uh, they had many Ethiopian immigrants who spoke Amharic. Um, and so they really made an effort to have every single meeting be translated into three languages so they could all understand what was going on. And they really built some strong ties that way. Um, it's really important to celebrate these victories of all these co-ops that have been started in the city. Um, this is a newsletter from the organization WISH um, that was helping tenants start these co-ops. Owners of the Mandela Cooperative at, at the opening, this newsletter is from 1993, so Nelson Mandela had recently been released from prison and these folks decided to name their cooperative after Nelson Mandela. Um, you also see a cooperative named for Harriet Tubman, and so these co-ops were really often named, there's named for, for important um, leaders, often important black leaders, global leader, leaders really. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a celebration, it's important to celebrate this, but also to really recognize the work of these commons. Um, and so uh, the commons really require a lot of work, and especially in the midst of this sort of uh, intense, um, int hyper-gentrifying city. So it's important, I think, to look at the challenges here of maintaining these commons and urban spaces. And so out of my research, I saw really four main challenges. There's lots more, but here are four. Um, one was financial challenges. So um, as I mentioned, often by the time tenants have purchased a building, the capital has been completely sucked out of the resource. Um, and so tenants have a lot of financial catching up to do. They get zero interest loans from the city. There's different ways that they can kind of work to put the financing together. Um, but ultimately, they still are enmeshed in capitalism in some degree. Thank you. Um, and so they really have um, financial challenges. Another challenge that I thought was really interesting were sort of questions of access and exclusion. Who's allowed to move in? As I mentioned, that was important for folks. Having a co-op, you have a board that votes on who is allowed to move in, and that was really important to people. But, you know, we in Washington, D.C. have a waiting list for public housing of 40,000 people. You know, a lot of people need affordable housing. There's not enough space for them in these co-ops. So how do you determine who gets to move in? And how do you determine when you need to evict someone? I mean, these are real questions. You know, there are sometimes people move in and they never pay their co-op monthly fee and they're gonna, that's gonna destroy the co-op. Um, or they are behaving in ways that are making people feel unsafe. So questions of access and exclusion are really difficult and really have to be dealt with. Um, the challenge of participation, who is doing the work of the commons, it's highly gendered, um, and people talked about this. Actually, people didn't talk about this a lot. <laughs> it's just, people didn't actually talk a lot about the gendered nature of the work. I just noticed that it was. Um, a couple of, I think there were two women who brought it up and said, oh, women do all the work. But for the most part, women were clearly doing all the work, but weren't really saying that much about it, which was interesting. Um, but it is, it is highly gendered. Um, and then finally, the temptation of co-optation. So when you are in a hot real estate market, if you don't have controls on your space to ensure that it's gonna um, remain affordable over time and remain decommodified the way it's been set up to be, then there can be a temptation uh, to, to take the cash to sell out. Um, so I should note also that this can be really creative and joyful work, and people definitely talked to me about that too. So it's not all drudgery at all. In fact, it's this very creative work, unlike the work that most folks are doing in their jobs, their waged jobs, which don't afford them much opportunity for, for creativity. Um, okay, so a few concluding points here. Um, one, I think we need to, so I focused really closely on this one manifestation of the urban commons, these housing co-ops. Um, but I do think we need to think and enact the urban commons more broadly, of course. And this is just an example. Um, you know, we can think about the urban commons in terms of schooling, in terms of um, energy, education, right, food, public space, the city itself. This is an example. And actually, just today, I was able to see the Parque du Bijiga, um, which is this vacant lot that's sort of unclear what's going to happen to it. People are calling it the Parque du Bijiga to, to emphasize, yes, it's a park. Um, and that's exactly what happened here in the 1960s in DC. There was a plot of vacant land owned by a speculator who was planning to develop luxury housing on it. And the people living in the neighborhood said, no, we need a park for our kids. And they just went in there and built a park. And they, uh, the Ontario Lakers youth group started it and they called it the ghetto stadium. And they just created this space. And 11 years later, they convinced the city to buy the plot of land from the, de the speculator and to turn it into a public park. And today, it's still a public park. So that, to me, is a great example of kind of seizing an urban common. So thinking about it, of course, broadly is, is important. Um, second, I think it's important to practice commoning and practice 
meaning both kind of in the present, something we practice, and um, also something practicing for the future. So um, we, um, yeah, and we can practice at the scales that are available to us while practicing for, for larger scales. This is a, another space that I could conceive of as a commons. Um, Two more minutes. Um, and this is a collective art space in DC where people um, collectively govern this space and, uh, and create culture there, including children. And I think it's really important to include children in all of our commenting efforts, um, and, in, and especially in kind of learning how to comment together. Um, third, I think it's important to recognize commenting as a pragmatic practice. And this is maybe, I don't know, a little controversial sometimes, but, but I don't think people need to, I don't, people do not enter into commenting necessarily with some sort of politics. I don't think at all. Um, I think they enter into commenting because their options are limited and they have, they have few choices um, and they need stuff and the commons is the best way to get that stuff. So this is an example of a food co-op, which we might conceive of as a kind of form of the commons um, that was opened in Washington, D.C. in 1971, named for Martin Luther King a few years after he was assassinated in a place that was um, known as a food desert. We call them these, you know, food desert. Um, and so they needed food, <laughs> needed groceries, and, and no bank was gonna give a group of low-income black people a loan to open a business, and so they did it through starting a cooperative. And so this is, an, an example, I think, of sort of the pragmatic nature of commenting and how it's important to think about it um, in a pragmatic way. Um, that doesn't mean we can't develop a political consciousness through commenting efforts. I think that's totally correct, but I don't think that people need to be politicized in some certain way before we can get going with, with commenting efforts. Um, and then finally, I really think we can learn to comment. In the US case, I think in particular, we do not grow up uh, <laughs> learning how to collectively make decisions and work together um, to, to govern resources. So I think it's important to think strategically about how we can learn, teach, and learn collectively how to comment. Um, and if we provide spaces to practice, we can um, learn to work to collectively govern the resources we need to survive. This is a nice example of commenting in education, I think, and learning. Um, the freedom schools um, in, that were opened in Mississippi in the summer of 64 and 65, um, and uh, people going to the South in Mississippi and helping people learn to read and write and, and register to vote and learn to participate in democracy. Um, and I think we need to learn how to common because the commons are always contingent. They're always under threat. Um, and if we're gonna seize them and keep them and expand them, we need to figure out together how to do that no matter where in the world that we live. Thank you. <laughs>